Okay, here we go. Um, so the second talk of the morning. So this is uh, uh, Dennis Noble from Oxford. And uh, Dennis has been a, a pivotal figure in the unification of uh, new views on physiology, uh, evolution, and cognition. So we're very uh, delighted to have this talk. Please, Dennis. Thank you very much, Michael. And let me begin by saying that I, I'm thoroughly enjoying this meeting. I wish I could be over there in Boston uh, with you. Uh, but there happens to be something very important tomorrow that prevents that. Um, anyway, I'm going to start, before I show my presentation, with a little bit of explanation of how I got involved in um, the parallels between a systems approach to biology and Buddhist thought. And it all started with writing this little book some years ago. In fact, nearly 20 years ago is when I started writing The Music of Life. And at that time, I was interacting with the um, professor of Sanskrit here in Oxford, Richard Gombrich, a fantastic um, Buddhist scholar, wrote a book, What the Buddha Thought, which is one of his most insightful and popular books. But of course, a lot of her books that are way beyond what most of us can uh, deal with. Um, and it became natural for me in discussion with um, a scholar of Buddhist studies like Richard Gombrich to see the parallels between coming to a systems approach to biology, which means emphasizing the processes that enable us as organisms uh, to exist, um, and emphasizing those rather than the particular components of which uh, the organisms are made. And as I approached the chapter that I wrote on the brain, I couldn't help thinking, but then <laughs> that means automatically that there is no thing inside here that can be said to be me. Um, that it wasn't a matter, therefore, of looking for a particular structure. No doubt there will be particular structures that are crucially important for me to be who I am and for me to have this sense of self, but it won't be just a particular object you could take out of my brain and say, here is Dennis Noble in, in a pot. And my natural way of explaining that was that meant that, of course, as an object, the self doesn't exist. Um, now, that automatically, of course, was very close to what um, Richard Gombrich and I were discussing in, in relation to Buddhism. And inevitably, therefore, I decided when I finished writing this book to use a particular um Buddhist parable, the Oxherder parable, uh, which attempts to explain pictorially what is meant by the uh, no self concept. Anyway, that's by way of background to how I got involved in all of this. When The Music of Life was published, quite soon after, I was invited um, all over the world to talk to uh, groups involved in Buddhist thought or to groups of Buddhist monks, including a huge congress held in Thailand, which must have been the biggest organization of, uh, of, of Buddhist monks I've ever seen in one place, and um, two dialogues or debates or whatever you want to call them with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. All of this, of course, has uh, meant that I've got even deeper involved in the comparisons. But with that, I'll now turn to share my screen and um, let the PowerPoint appear. Um, I've called it biological relativity in interaction with leading Buddhist monks uh, because all the parts of my presentation will consist in that. The first part will be one of my discoveries following my interactions with Richard Gombrich and, and indeed with other uh, scholars of Buddhist 
ideas here in Oxford and elsewhere. Um, I found in a 7th century commentary by the uh, Korean monk Won Hyul uh, that he had um, he had used the four-cornered logic of Nagarjuna to explain what seemed to me to be a very good description of what at that time could be seen to be a formulation of the principle of biological relativity. Hey, hey Dennis, Dennis yes. I'm sorry, we're, we're not seeing any slides. Are you sharing a screen? Yes. Oh, I, I thank you very much. That's very important. I will make sure I share the screen. Thank you. Um, let's, let's do that now. Yes. Okay. Is that working? Much better. Okay, good. We can go straight then to the presentation. Um, yes, the, the first item I'm going to discuss then is uh, the work of Won Hill, which is a remarkable discovery. And lots of people within Buddhist studies have also interacted with me on that. Um, that will be the first part. I will then be using um, that uh, discovery in discussion with monks at Silsang Sa, one of the temples in South Korea that I visited uh, for temple stay, uh, around six temples in 2019, forming part of the filming for a documentary that is about to come out a bit later this year. And then finally, I will sum up some important conclusions that come from items one and two by referring to Stefano Zacchetti's new book on the Daji du Lun, um, showing the openness of Buddhist thought. You'll see the significance of that as I go through parts one and two. Um, now, first of all, then, um, the principle of biological relativity in the work of Won Hill. Won Hill um, is very much a folk hero in Korea. He's famed for his harmonization approach to disputes. He harmonized the neo-Confucianist uh, nature of, of Korea at that time with his Buddhist ideas. The Shiller dynasty was very supportive of Buddhism. The later Choson dynasty was not. Um, that was one of his major achievements. He was also famous for jumping over the wall, which meant that he did not think that monks should just reside in the monastery. They should get mixed up with the outside world. Um, he had good relations with several women. Um, and he was also famous for his one mind theory of Buddhism, the idea that in, in enlightenment is an inherent characteristic of mind. We just have to discover, discover it. Um, the images here, the one on the left is um, is uh, Bogwang John Hall, which is a shrine to Won Hyo. The one on the right is a painting of him, but made long after his death. So we've no idea whether he really looked like that. Now, what Won Hyo did in his commentary on the Diamond Sutra um, was to illustrate the concept of conditioned arising by using the relation between uh, the seed and fruit of a plant with the very clear idea that causation goes both ways. I'll come on to that text in just a moment. I think that is very much a form of the principle of biological relativity as I laid it out in Dance to the Tune of Life, uh, because the central concept is that there is no privileged level of causation. And of course, all of this is the very opposite of selfish gene theory and of the central dogma of molecular biology. Genes do not creator's body and mind. So here is um, Won Hyo's classical Chinese text on the left. Um, and the translation I've given on the right, which I'm going to read, um, is the accepted English translation. I did a semi-literal translation of my own with the help of Stefano Zacchetti, whom I've already referred to. So I already know that this is not a travesty of what the uh, Chinese characters are saying. I'll just read it. The fruit and the seed are not the same, for they have different shape. However, they are not different. Besides, the seed and the fruit are not inalienable, for the fruit is produced from the seed. 
However, they are not eternal, for there is no seed when it is in the state of the fruit. I think I need to explain that for a moment. Um, in one sense, that is clearly not true. A fruit contains a seed. Um, what he means here is, of course, that there are different levels of organization here. And the level of organization for a seed is not the level of organization of the fruit. The seed did not enter into the fruit, for the seed does not exist when it is in the state of the fruit. The fruit does not extinguish the seed, for the fruit does not exist when it's in the state of the seed. Again, this is a statement, I think, that has to be understood about levels. Uh, things exist at different levels of organization. Since it neither enters nor is extinguished, this is, of course, Nagarjuna's type four-cornered logic. Since it neither enters nor is extinguished, there is no arising. Since it is neither eternal nor annihilable, there is no ceasing. And since there is no ceasing, non-being cannot be proclaimed. Since there is no arising, being cannot be proclaimed. Since it is free from the two extremes, it cannot be stated as both being and non-being, um, since it does not correspond to the middle. It cannot be stated as neither being nor non-being. Therefore, it is stated that it is free from the four perspectives and cut off from verbal expression. Now, it needs a lot of interpretation, but I think we can see the general idea of what he's getting at. And I did the following experiment. I've just taken the first seven or eight lines of his text in the accepted translation. I've substituted phenotype for fruit and genotype for the seed. And it then reads, the phenotype and the genome are not the same, for they have different shape. Well, they certainly do. And however, they are not different. Besides, the genome and the phenotype are not annihilable, for the phenotype is produced from the genome. However, they are not eternal, for there is no genome when it is in the state of the phenotype. The, phen the genome did not enter into the phenotype, for the genome does not exist when it is in the state of the phenotype. Again, that has to be understood as a question of levels. It's not whether it can exist at the same time. The phenotype does not exist in extinct. Sorry, the phenotype does not extinguish the genome, for the phenotype does not exist when it's in the state of the genome. All of this, of course, um, uh, is uh, playing around with uh, the concept. But read like that, it's almost a modern text of uh, relativistic um, systems biology. Now I come to the second part of my talk, which is. Um, experience of using Juan Hill's work in the filming in 2019 of a documentary uh, in debating with monks in six of the historic um, temples in South Korea. There is a five minute trailer, there's the link to it, uh, which was released during the pandemic. During the pandemic, of course, everything was frozen. The um, documentary is planned for screening a little bit later this year. There's also a book on the dialogues at the moment only available in Korean, but there's a planned translation. What happened at uh, Silsing Sa was not very different what happened in uh, the other temples I visited. I had private discussions with some of the monks. I had discussions with some of the people who are visiting uh, the temples for um, meditation sessions and so on. Um, and as a consequence of that, at Silsang Sa itself, where this person is the head monk, Do Bup, um, I was asked whether I'd give a talk on Wan Hill and biological relativity to the um, assembled audience in the temple, which is exactly uh, what I did. That was fine, and talking about Wan Hill was a very good thing to do, because as I said earlier, he's a hero in South Korea, uh, extremely well known, and so it, um, it it rang bells with the audience. I think that's the best way to put it, and particularly with Do Bop, who turned out to be himself um, steeped in uh, study of some of One Hill's uh, commentaries. What I did not expect uh, was, of course, there would be questions at the end. Well, I did expect questions, um, but they went much further than my talk on one hill and i was faced suddenly without having thought too much about it um to deal with questions from the audience on reincarnation on nirvana and a number of other 
um, concepts that are current in uh, Buddhist ideas. Um, I did my best to deal with them. And um, what's interesting about this is that, um, and I'll come on to that in just a moment. Yes, here it is. Um, I, totally unprepared for the question on reincarnation, I simply almost half jokingly replied, well, uh, my cells have been reincarnating themselves for two to three billion years. Um, the audience took this very seriously, and I made a side glance at the head monk over upon my left to check whether he wished to, in some sense, correct me and say, no, 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 Professor Neville, this is not what Buddhists think reincarnation was about. Um, he gave a very clear sign, please carry on. He had no intention of interrupting me at all. Um, with Nirvana, I had a better opportunity because I used um, one here as a guy. I replied that it could be seen as something like the approach to enlightenment. There is, in fact, a chapter in Chapter 9 of the of Dance to the Tune of Life called the, specifically the relativity of epistemology. And the answer, of course, there is one never gets there because one never ceases to ask questions. Uh, the quest never um, finishes. Incidentally, I got exactly the same response, or if you like, absent of response from Do Bob. He didn't want to interfere with my interaction with the with his audience at all. Now, finally, I come to a resolution of this puzzle um, in what Stefano Zacchetti, the professor of Buddhist studies in Oxford until very recently when he passed away um, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, the resolution of the puzzle here uh, is interestingly in his book on the Daji Du Lun, and I'm going to read sections of the book to illustrate that. What is the puzzle? Well, I half expected going to um, be ensconced in several of the temples, living with them, and um, to the extent that a, loss, a lay person could, taking part in all of their activities, I half expected to find that these temples remote from the big cities in beautiful mountain and similar um, areas of, of great natural beauty would be in a sense cut off from the common interests of humanity, not so concerned um, with what is important in the practice of a, a system like Buddhism, um, I found just the reverse. An openness, clearly, in that discussion at Sil Sangsa, but had the same uh, experience at the other temples I visited, to the extent that there just really seemed to be no dogma. It was as though one was just taking part in a scientific uh, discussion. I'll read from the Daji Du Lun, because what Stefano Zacchetti did before he passed away, sadly, um, was a very careful multilingual analysis of both Indian and Chinese texts on the Diamond Sutra and its commentaries. And what he found, before I go into the quotes that illustrate it, is this, there is no canonical text. The later commentaries he was able to show had become partly incorporated into the later versions of the sutras and so on, in almost a continuous development of Buddhist thought. He writes, even the faintest echo of the Daji Du Lun's voice in Indian texts, remember the Daji Du Lun is a Chinese text, a commentary, even the faintest echo of the Daji Du Lun's voice in Indian texts represents an important piece of evidence for reconstructing its history. In particular, my analysis has evidenced a significant connection between some of the Daji Du Lun's glosses and a specific recension of the larger la, the larger Prajna Paramita that chiefly represented by the Gilgut manuscript corpus. That's the corpus of text that he was analyzing. 
Previous research has found in various types of Buddhist scriptures instances of interaction between exegesis and textual transmission in varying degrees similar to those investigated in this study. The systematic occurrence of these patterns of textual development points towards underlying notions of sacred scriptures as relatively open texts. The way in which the Mahayana Sutra literature was transmitted shaped by the act interventions into the texts has profound implications from a religious point of view these practices of textual transmission reflect an image of sacred text which is anything but inalterable and untouchable the idea that a text of this kind should be transmitted mechanically in a form as close as possible to its original has no place here quite the opposite in fact Alteration and expansion were essential components of the way the texts were conceived and used, especially in the early phase of their history. In these texts, we do not face occasional accidental interpolations, uh, typos or deliberate interventions, but a pervasive attitude, uh, attitude, of course, towards the scripture itself. It is probable that such a textual fluidity is also a reflection of deeply ingrained notions of um, a Buddhist notions of truth and language. I believe those are the last lines that um, uh, uh, Stefano Zacchetti wrote because he passed away um, before he was able to correct the proofs of this book. The proofs of the book were corrected by two other Buddhist scholars. Um, what I want to first of all say before I come to my acknowledgements is this is precisely, of course, what I found in the tour of the Buddhist temples in South Korea. There was an openness to discussion that made it feel almost like the one was a, a exploring a science with uh, the audience and, of course, with the monks themselves. And what um, Stefano Zacchetti has shown, I think, very clearly in his analysis of both the um, original Indian texts written in Sanskrit or Pali and the Chinese texts in which he was working that had been written in China is that you exactly see uh, mm -hmm. the openness even in the texts themselves. So I want to acknowledge Stefano Zacchetti's generous time in helping me to understand the seventh century commentary of One Hill more completely. Um, Clearly, what I encountered at various Buddhist temples in Korea shows that the open approach to texts that he describes is still alive in Buddhist practice there. And reading Stefano's book, the remarkable nature of his textual discoveries between Chinese and Indian sources and his conclusions um, uh, about openness in Buddhist texts, those are all gifts that I will always treasure. And incidentally, and this is a general feeling here in Oxford and, and worldwide, Buddhist studies themselves have lost a remarkable scholar and a very deeply kind man. His command of Pali, Sanskrit, Japanese, Chinese, and a variety of other languages was absolutely phenomenal. I want also to acknowledge my interaction with the Korean monks. Uh, well, there are about six temples, but I've forgotten the names of the two of the others. Um, Tong Do Sa Sil Sang Sa, which is where the uh, talk um, in Do Bup's temple occurred, Bek Yang Sa, Mi Huang Sa, and this is, I think, at Bek Yang Temple, yes it is, um, where I met another extraordinary uh, phenomenon in Korean Buddhism. Uh, this monk is a woman. And incidentally, uh, the name for a nun in um, Korean is exactly the same as the name for a monk, it's Sunim, and nobody makes any distinction uh, between the two. Well, thank you very much, and with that I'll stop sharing screen um, and be happy um, to deal with any questions that people may have. Now I have to find out where I stop sharing screen. Ah, here we are. Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah. Yeah. Questions, comments, thoughts? Thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience, uh, learning, or studying, reflecting, meditating together with the monks. I just wanted to express my delight um, that, uh, uh, and, and simply note that I've had a similar experience uh, of, of meeting an extremely open uh, space of uh, mind and intelligence when discussing with uh, representatives of very traditional learning. So it's, um, as I think you showed so well, it's, it's easy to assume that what is being transmitted are, the, are basically dogma and that the uh, main objective is to transmit those articles of faith. But in fact, uh, often, and of course it depends on, on who teaches also, but uh, what takes place is very much the, uh, a process of discovery uh, and that I think can be uh, compared to uh, scientific research very, very well. And it is a very, um, it becomes then also uh, uh, incumbent on us to try to uh, do what we can as, as you do. So uh, in a, such an exemplary uh, fashion support uh, that traditional uh, community so that we can we can benefit from those uh, communications, um, yeah. And uh, so I I thought perhaps if if you uh, would give some advice for for us uh, since this uh, sense of collective um, exploration together with the representatives of what should we call it traditional approaches to uh, Buddhist learning and uh, and practice since that is very much part of what we. We, we aim to undertake, if you would give some advice for us to how, how we can make that process really flourish. Well, thank you very much for those comments, and I'm delighted you have the same um, kind of experience, because it just blew my mind away. I, I wasn't totally unprepared for it. I'd already, as I said earlier, um, been involved in debates, for example, with his Holiness the Dalai Lama, and I, I found there the openness just extraordinary. Um, I, I, I don't know. It, well, I could go on with, uh, with that for some time. Let me turn, though, to what you're asking as a question following your comment. I think the message that we need to um, take home for ourselves and the science community particularly um, these are traditions that have thought extraordinarily long about what some of the deepest questions of um, that we have to ask ourselves: Who are we? What are we? Where are we from? And so on. And um, science has not always been terribly good. And that's what I say in another little book that's just appeared, Understanding Living Systems, just published by Cambridge University Press. Science, particularly biological science, over the last 40 or 50 years, has not been terribly good at what I would call the humility of recognizing other forms of wisdom. And I put those words together quite carefully. This is a tradition with which we can interact with huge benefit to both sides. They are extremely keen to interact with interested scientists. The director of the film being made, the documentary film, well, it's already made, it just hasn't been screened yet. Um, he had no difficulty uh, convincing the head monks, including the equivalent, as it were, of an archbishop, which is their um, uh, leader of the Jogge order. I had an audience with him. Um, no problem at all in welcoming scientists into their midst and very delighted that I was prepared to live exactly as they do, take part in their meditations in the morning. A particular example of that is actually the 
um, monk uh, uh, that I showed in the last picture, who is actually a woman, um, I I asked her after my debates with her, uh, she's a very good cook, incidentally, which it, it intrigued me a lot. But I asked her at the end, you know, can I hear you sing, chant? Because, you know, I'm fascinated by the fact that you are a woman. Do you chant in the same register as um, the monks? Uh, meaning, of course, the male monks. Uh, and she said, well, yes, get up at four o'clock next morning and you come and listen to me chant before the meditation session. I did. And, of course, this deep alto voice came out singing in exactly the same register uh, as the men. Absolutely um, huge experience. But the openness was also there, you see. In this case, more a matter of a personal openness. I was not apparently invading her space by uh, wishing to be present during her chanting. I, I think the openness is something we can benefit from. Coming back to the meditation process, um, there is, as some of you will know already, uh, quite a lot of evidence for the efficacy of meditative states if maintained uh, regularly and, and, and with due diligence, as it were. Um, there's, there's lots of experiments that now have been done um, on uh, trained meditators. Personally, I've used it a lot in my own life and in times of great difficulty and have found the benefits to be there. I do emphasize, though, one thing that I think is important for us to recognize. They, of course, come to this concept of no self partly through experience of what happens in the meditation state. You actually come to asking yourself the question, what is this? Which is, of course, can be anything, a candle flame or just oneself or one's breathing. They come to that feeling that there isn't really a, a proper thing, which is uh, the self, um, through meditation. Obviously, those of us who are systems biologists have come to the same kind of notion through very different uh, ways of approaching the same question. Is that an empirical fact, or is it just a way in which we look at the world? There's a deep question, and I don't know the answer, because they see it as an experiential fact, therefore an empirical fact. I see it as a philosophical point of view on biology. But I've already spoken too long in response to your point in question, but thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dennis. It, uh, yeah, it's a uh, very, very nice uh, shared experience for sure. Which and yes, that that echoes a lot of things. I think we have experienced ourselves uh, in in our own modest work. Uh, I had two 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 sort of questions uh, asking for insight from you. Uh, one is about textual fluidity, but I feel like I just saw a glimpse of uh, maybe a question uh, by, by by Carl on the same topic. So maybe I'll hold on to that. Uh, so, so what what you mentioned about uh, books uh, not not being fixed content that that has to be preserved as such, but but uh, maybe ingrained in, in Buddhist concepts of uh, language and and I think you said truth. Uh, I yeah, I'd like to hear some some insights, but maybe that's Carl's uh, question, which I didn't get to read. Uh, so, so my my other question is um, is about the substitution kind of uh, exercise that that you you, you did with uh, genotype and phenotype and i find that uh, such a, a promising sort of practice and i recognize s s some of what we did in our own uh, translational uh, sub substitution exercises uh, early on in our uh, attempts uh, to, to to do our work um between yeah B buddhism and, and cognition uh, or biology and different 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 types of cognition, I guess. Um, and I guess it's this substitution combined with being accepting of uh, being playful, um, immersive, and, and accepting ambiguity. Uh, I, I was wondering what were your insights in, in this exercise and what, what insights you had from, from, from doing it? Uh, did, you, did you do it on, on other examples? Uh, how, how did, yeah, how, what did it bring you? 
I've come to respect the cultural basis of languages. I, you can't, I mean, there, even, even between languages as similar as English and French, I'm totally fluent in French, um, you know, you, there, are, there are concepts you cannot properly express and translate across from one to the other. And my goodness, is that true of Oriental languages? Um, I've managed to learn enough myself to be able to, uh, as it were, check with my own um, way of literally translating uh, both texts like Juan Hyo's and, of course, a lot of the poetic uh, work of the East, which is almost inaccessible to us because the translations hardly ever get the feel uh, for, the, for the poetry. So I think we just have to respect this huge cultural difference. And for me, it's a huge privilege as we to step over that huge cultural difference into um, a, an environment in uh, a language like Korean, which incidentally is a very verb-oriented language. Because whole sentences can be just a verb. Uh, the, uh, the emphasis on the who is doing it is, is not so important. Very different situation uh, from that of English. But to turn to the other question, and it is exactly what uh, Carl has put up on the, the chat. It is, is textual fluidity an example of biological relativity in the cult context of cultural niche, Buddhist notions of truth and language, um, cultural niche construction? I think it's a nice way of putting it, Carl. And um, it seems to me that that experience of the um, parallel between the discoveries that Stefano Zacchetti made in his um, work on the Darji du Lun and the fluidity of the texts um, fits so perfectly with my chapter nine in Dance to the Tune of Life on the relativity of epistemology um, that I was amazed myself by the extent to which that comparison can be explored. I think they are aware that they're in a cultural niche, or possibly more aware than most uh, people in the world, uh, because it's what they ponder on in the, the consistent question in, in deep meditation, what is this? And you ask the question until you almost don't know what the words mean. And, and that's an interesting question. You can actually meditate on the meaning of a word, and it just it just goes. It is an extraordinary process. So I think what Carl is suggesting in his point on the chat line is is absolutely correct. It's it's a relativity of epistemology, and that seems to me, since epistemology is knowledge that organisms have, is another form of the principle of biological relativity, if you wish to put it that way. Um, anyway, I hope those answer the, the two points. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, actually, this echoes nicely uh, what um, uh, Anil said yesterday about dissolving the meaning of consciousness but by studying it instead of trying to solve it. Uh, I, I really like it. Yeah, th th thank you so much, Dennis. This was uh, very helpful. Great. Anybody else? If, if no one else has anything, Dennis, I wonder, um, just, just for the few remaining minutes, if you wouldn't mind, in case there's anybody that doesn't know uh, sort of your, your main work, if you just want to riff a little bit on physiology, evolution, genetics, the, that kind of stuff, just, you know, for a few minutes, give people an idea of your, your take on things. Very happy to lecture for either 30 seconds or 20, 20 hours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 30 seconds is what you really want. Yes. I strongly believe that for the last 80 years, roughly, ever since the book by Julian Huxley, The Modern Synthesis, was published in 1942 through to now, we have been strongly misled by a particularly dogmatic version of evolutionary biology. And that is, of course, the total interpretation. Genes are important. They're extremely important templates for the making of RNAs and the construction of proteins. If they didn't exist, we wouldn't be able to do uh, what we do in uh, as living systems. 
But the idea that somehow or another you can do what Descartes envisaged all those years ago, if I know what is in that semen, I could predict exactly the uh, adult organism. I'm paraphrasing his uh, thesis, of course, um, which was written in French. Um, it, it seems to me to have been one of the biggest mistakes that humanity has made in its investigations of the world. And it excludes purpose in organisms, which has to do with what you're talking about. Agency, what is that? It is having a, a, a sense of purpose, having anticipation, inference, to use um, uh, Carl's uh, lovely talk. Um, so that's excluded. What's also excluded is any form of inheritance of acquired characteristics. What I've done in my work recently is to see the determine the extent to which one can unravel the details of that and what i've been doing during the last 20 years is essentially immersing myself in the molecular biology that gave rise to the central dogma to show that it simply is misinterpreted uh, the actual molecular biological evidence does not support the modern synthesis and um, the same has been true, of course, for unraveling the exclusion through the Weissman barrier idea of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. I'm afraid that barrier has just completely gone. We now know that RNAs um, controlling the DNA uh, pass readily through uh, the barrier, so-called, between the soma and the germline. So there's a brief summary, uh, Mike, of saying that I'm having a great time, incidentally, including debating with some of the key people supporting the other side. And if you're fascinated by all of that, there is a video online um, on my website, dennisnoble.com, of uh, an extraordinary debate with Richard Dawkins just a year ago. Uh, there's my brief reply, uh, Mike, okay? Super. Th thanks so much, Dennis. Okay. Um, and with that, if nobody else has anything, uh, now it's time for the coffee break. Um, thank you. Thanks, Dennis.